Okay, we are in chapter 3, which discusses organic molecules, and we are in section 3.3, .3, and this is the second video dealing with the lipids. So we're picking up here, talking about uh, some specialized types of lipids. The main lipids are going to be, right back here, it's going to be our, there we go, are triacylglycerols. These are going to be the fats and oils. And then we looked at saturated fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, uh, the trans fats, and then essential fatty acids. And so we're up here with phospholipids. Now, phospholipids, uh, basically what's happened here is you've got a, <coughs> you, you have a triacylglycerol which is a glycerol and three fatty acids, and we've replaced one of those fatty acids with a mineral group, a phosphate. And then actually it's a phosphate and then another organic group, but we'll stay with the phosphate because that's the namesake right here where it talks about a phospholipid. Okay, <clears throat> so this modified lipid is part of the cell membrane or what's called the plasma membrane. And here, get the explanation, one fatty acid is replaced by a phosphate group and what's called a choline group, thus making part of the, uh, part of this molecule a uh, polar molecule. So it has an electrical charge to it. Okay. okay, so here's our diagram from the textbook. And you can see here's our glycerol group right here. Here's the two fatty acids. And then one of these fatty acids has been replaced by, here's our phosphate group, and here's the organic group called a choline group. And then here's a diagram showing the idea that around the outside of a cell you'd have a double layer of this modified lipid. Okay. Another uh, set of compounds in the lipid category are the carotenoids. Now the reason these are in the lipid category is because they are hydrophobic. They are nonpolar and they and so they um, are not water soluble. Okay, carotenoids. These are yellow orange plant pigments. Now I think we pretty quickly guess a plant that is rich in carotenoids. Carrots. And sweet potatoes, squash, yellow corn, pretty much any type of yellow or orange plant material is going to be rich in, in these carotenoids. And the functions of the carotenoids. In plants, carotenoids are going to play a role in photosynthesis. And then we don't produce carotenoids, but we definitely consume a lot of them. Anytime we consume plant materials, even uh, even green leafy plant materials are going to be rich in carotenoids. We just can't see them because of all the green chlorophyll. Um, the uh, carotenoids, after we consume them, are going to form vitamin A and another compound called retinol, which is used in light reception in the eyes. So the uh, carotenoids play a role in us as well as the plant. And here's a diagram from your textbook showing Right here is beta carotene, which of course would be a carotenoid. And then after we consume this, animals consume this, it's going to be split and we're going to form vitamin A and retinol. Okay, okay another category of steroids, I mean of, of lipids, is the steroids. And uh, steroids are, have a completely different structure than the triacylglycerols. So these steroids consist of four carbon rings that are bonded to one another. And some examples of steroids are cholesterol, the bile salts that allow us to uh, uh, di help us digest fats, uh, several of the hormones, uh, one called cortisol, and then the uh, sex hormones of uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Okay, so 
Let's take a look at these diagrams uh, from your textbook. And notice one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Four of these carbon ring structures that are bonded to one another. That makes up the steroids. So let's go over from there into the proteins. Now, proteins have a lot of diverse functions. And proteins can have a lot of different functions because proteins can have an almost infinite variety of structures. So here's a list of the different functions of proteins. They can serve as enzymes. They can be structural proteins that will strengthen uh, the various tissues of the body, such as collagen, uh, collagen and elastin. Uh, storage pro uh, proteins. So, uh, for example, in eggs, we have storage proteins that will store up uh, amino acids for use in the developing, uh, developing embryo. Uh, likewise, seeds, for the same reason, they will store, uh, store amino acids for that developing embryo. Transport proteins, uh, proteins that are going to uh, transport oxygen in your blood, also uh, uh, the surface of your cells. You have many different transport proteins that move uh, substances in and out of the cell. Regulatory proteins such as some of the hormones, such as insulin. Um, and just a wide variety of functions of these proteins. Well here's motile proteins, we're talking about uh, muscle, uh, for muscle contractions, uh, protective proteins, uh, things like the antibodies that are part of our immune system. So, let's go back here. Proteins have many diverse functions. Proteins can have these diverse functions because they have an almost infinite variety of structures. Okay, so let's go down here. The structure of a protein. Let's look at that. Now we've got the protein is the polymer. And the protein is made up of amino acids. So the amino acids are the monomers. And there are 20 different amino acids. Okay. Now here's the structure of an amino acid. That's the monomer. We have a central carbon attached to an R group and each of the 20 different amino acids has a unique R group. And then on one end we have the amino group. On the other end we have the carboxyl group. Okay, okay here's the uh, diagram from your textbook showing the 20 different amino acids and it has these grouped uh, according to certain ones that have polar R groups. Um, others will have nonpolar R groups. Some tend to have R groups that cause them to be acidic, others basic, and so uh, just a variety of characteristics there. Okay, the amino, so the amino and the carboxyl ends of the amino acid are usually ionized, that is, they are charged or polar. So here's the diagram from your textbook again, and here's the form of of the amino acid we looked at a minute ago. This is the form that you need to be able to recognize on the test. The only thing, instead of having this methyl group right here, I'll just have that as a R because this would be just one particular type of amino acid. Now in a lot of cases, these ends of the amino acid are uh, ionized. This one has picked up a hydrogen with a charge. This has given up a Hydrogen has a negative charge, so positive charge on this end, negative charge on this end. Okay, so these amino acids have the ability to gain and lose hydrogen ions. So one of the things that uh, we've seen in lab is amino acids can act as buffers. A buffer, remember, is a material that is going to uh, maintain a stable pH. It's going to resist pH change. Now those R groups, they can be polar or nonpolar, they can be acidic or basic. Uh, they can have a lot, they can give the amino acids a lot of different characteristics. So where do these amino acids come from? Well, kind of like everything else moving up the food chain, it's going to begin with the bacteria and the plants, just like energy, the energy that we use 
comes from plants capturing energy from the sun. The amino acids that we need for uh, making, uh, making our proteins are going to initially be manufactured by bacteria and plants and then be passed on up the food chain. So the bacteria and plants can synthesize all of the amino acids. Humans, on the other hand, can only synthesize 11 out of the 20 amino acids. That leaves nine amino acids that we can't manufacture. These are called the nine essential amino acids. And so the essential amino acids, these are the amino acids that humans cannot synthesize. They have to be obtained as intact amino acids in the diet. So anytime you see this term essential nutrient, that is something that we can't manufacture in the human body, but we have to have it, and so we have to obtain it in the diet. Just kind of as an interesting side note, different animal species have different sets of essential amino acids. Now we've got the term peptide bonds. Anytime you see the term peptide, realize that that has something to do with amino acids and proteins. Peptide bonds are the bonds between amino acids. And so we're going to have amino acids that are bonded together to form dipeptides, which are then bonded together to form polypeptides, which eventually form proteins. So here's the diagram showing two different amino acids. We're going to pull out the water, link these together. This link right here, which you need to be able to recognize, uh, between this carbonyl group and this nitrogen the link bonding the two amino acids together that is called a peptide bond so anytime you see the term peptide it has something to do with proteins and amino acids this structure here is called a dipeptide two amino acids okay so let's look at uh, peptide bonds in just the sketch right here because this is going to look more like what you'll see on the test um, here you have an amino acid, you have another amino acid, pull the OH group off of the carboxyl end here, hydrogen off the amino end, link those two together, and this connection between the amino acids is the peptide bond. Okay. Now then, a protein consists of one or more polypeptide chains, and a polypeptide can consist of hundreds of amino acids. It can be anywhere from as few as 50 to uh, several thousand amino acids in length. But the polypeptide is a chain of amino acids. It's not necessarily a protein. Protein has a specific three-dimensional shape to it. It's a polypeptide chain that is folded and bent into a specific three-dimensional shape. So, sequence of amino acids determines the final protein structure and notice with three asterisks on it any change in the amino acid sequence means that we have a change in the final protein and we have 20 different amino acids linked together and uh, linked together into chains of several hundred so how many different combinations let's just say we're putting together 300 amino acids. We have 20 different amino acids. We change the position of just a single amino acid. We have a different final outcome in the protein. How many different combinations can we get? Well, the number is almost infinite. So, not all those are gonna be functional proteins, but it gives nature an almost infinite number of possibilities to try and the shape of the protein is critical to its function. Okay, and so we'll stop here and pick up uh, with the four levels of protein structure in the next video. Thank you.